Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuki. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first uh, plenary speaker of this uh, symposium. Um, as you can see there on the screen, we're going to hear about mining automation, uh, where are we going? And the plenary lecture will be presented by Professor Ross McCary from the University of Queensland in, in Brisbane. Um, I'm just going to read a, a brief extract from his uh, CV as written in the program. Uh, Professor McCary is uh, Professor of Mechanical Engineering in the School of Mechanical and Mining Engineering at the University of Queensland. And in the school he has been the program director for, or the foundation program director for mechatronic engineering. And he has also served as, as the chair of the school's teaching and learning committee, as well as uh, being director for research. Now his research interests are focused on machinery dynamics and control. Uh, with his current emphasis on mining equipment automation. And not only has he published widely in this field, but he's, the technologies developed in his group has also found its way into, in, into industry, which is very important uh, uh, for an engineer. So with that, I'd like to introduce our plenary speaker, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Ross. Thank you, Ian. The, um, the title of this talk is, is really a, a pricey for work that we've been doing over the last 15 or 16 years at the University of Queensland in the area of mining automation, surface mining automation in particular. And my aim here today is really to, to try to convey a little bit of what we've done and, and what it's shown us, but also to draw out a key message. And that key message is that in all of this work, we've found significant value in the concept of receding horizon control. But in the pursuit of that concept, one of the, the observations we've made is that the textbook methods, the, the methods that, that we'd like to apply because we find them in papers and they're well developed and, and we'd like to extend on those, haven't really worked well for us. And there are some reasons for this. And I think those reasons are connected to, to old friends, um, nonlinearity and uh, complex geometry. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll see that, 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 that the core principles, the basic tenets and ideas are actually really powerful. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, I, I thought I'd give you a, a quick tour of Australia just so you had a bit of a, a sense. So the two major mineral exports from Australia are iron ore, which is largely mined in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, and coal, which is mined down the east coast. Um, in the Bowen Basin above uh, in central Queensland, in the Hunter Valley in northern New South Wales and in the Illawarra area just south of Sydney. Uh, in uh, Western Australia we also find some large coal and nickel deposits and in South Australia the largest integrated deposit of coal, uranium and copper at Olympic Dam, um, the largest known resource for those, all of those minerals in the world. Um, Uranium is also mined in the Northern Territory along with diamonds and up here in the Gulf of Carpentaria we find the largest um, manganese mine in the world. And so there's this very diverse, very spread out distribution of minerals and, and that's one of the key drivers for, um, for the push towards automation in Australia. And I think it's probably fair to say most of the big activities in this area are happening. My hometown is, is Brisbane which is uh, around about here, roughly halfway up the coast, and uh, the University of Queensland has a strong focus in this area. So just, just in terms of some numbers, the size of, of, uh, of, uh, of the sector by its contribution to GDP is around about 6%. And it changes from, from uh, year to year, but in the last year, 35% um, of Australia's export earnings were achieved through the, um, the export of, of raw material, uh, minerals, specifically iron ore and coal. Um, we're the largest exporter of coal, iron ore, lead, diamonds, rutal, zinc, and zirconium, and the second largest producer of gold and uranium. So, so Australia really is there. What's quite interesting, and I think this is one of the reasons why we're so um, engaged with the whole concept of automation, is that our minds are are remote, as I've said, but they only employ directly a very small number of people, only around about 2% of the workforce, or 130-odd thousand. So this is, this is obviously 
one of the one of the key drivers or circumstances that has pushed the Australian industry to look towards automation. And there's a sort of view, I suppose, and it, it may be shared worldwide, I'm, I'm not sure, I've never tested it, but it's very strongly felt in Australia, that this is what mining is. It's people working in remote conditions using picks and shovels to, to drill holes. And, and that's, that's actually not the truth. The modern mining processes in Australia are as technologically advanced as anything you'll see and has really been reduced to, to uh, work behind a desk in many instances. Many of the key roles are, are, are done in, in what are called remote operating centres where, we, um, where we, we look to control the overall activities in mining production in much the same way as, as has been done for minerals processing but with the key distinction that these centres are located often many thousands of kilometres from where the activity is taking place. And there really is a lot going on. Rio Tinto um, launched in 2006 their Mine of the Future initiative, and it, it was really a quite bold and comprehensive attempt to pull together um, a number of technologies, and, and among those are uh, their, their remote operating centre at Perth Airport. They have, if you visit Perth, you'll find a, a very large building painted in the Rio Tinto Library. Which, which houses these remote workstations with Komatsu, one of the major equipment in, um, implementers or, or manufacturers. They, um, they've implemented autonomous trucks at several of their, their mines and now run around about 30 autonomous trucks. These are driverless trucks that are able to do their work without an operator on board. There's a lot of other activity, both um, in Western Australia and elsewhere, and at uh, two of the, um, the mines, the iron ore mines in the Pilbara, Jindalbar run by BHP Billiton and Solomon Mine by Fortescue Minerals Group or FMG, they're running a competitor's truck, a Caterpillar autonomous haul truck, and there's approximately 50 of these trucks working across those two sites. Um, and that technology, like the one below, uh, I've had the pleasure to work on over the last few years, and I'll, I'll touch on these, but uh, I didn't want to leave out the eastern states, and at the moment, uh, Peabody Coal or Peabody Energy is trialling an autonomous bulldozer for overburden removal at its Wulpinyong coal site in, in uh, near Mudgee in New South Wales. And these are bulldozers that are actually doing production work without people on board. There are, of course, other activities. Australia has the largest privately owned rail lines, there are two lines, they run parallel to each other, one's owned by BHP, the other one's owned by Rio Tinto, and both operate autonomous trains, uh, and there are many installations across Australia of um, autonomous drills, drills that um, are able to move themselves around, their, their purpose is to drill um, for the purpose of blasting, and they, they drill out these patterns of, of holes which are then charged with explosives uh, to, to break up the rock. And this is, again, uh, something that I think now is finding reasonably common application there. So just a, a sort of snapshot of activities, but they're things which, which sort of hint to a, to a sort of general level of activity. The question, of course, is why do we automate? And there are four reasons, and they're all relevant to the value proposition for mining. And the first of them is to achieve better process level control. When we have a person in the seat of a machine performing some critical mining function, the decisions they make can be critical to the performance of that site. And operators tend to be rather ad hoc in their decision making, leading to significant variance in, in performance and deviation from what might be called the overall mine plan. Of course, there's safety. So safety is a key consideration. We're bringing in engineering controls through automation that remove people from the hazards of the environment. And that's critical. There's analytics. There's a significant value opportunity <coughs> through understanding and optimising the mining process and um, reacting to the changes that occur. And of course, there's the issue of labour. And to put that in context, the, the key driver for the autonomous truck programs in Western Australia 
was the cost of bringing people out to, to those mines. A, a typical truck will have three shifts of operation, each with three operators, so nine drivers, and the cost for employing each of those, the total cost, including salary and, and relocation flights and so forth to bring them in and out, runs to approximately a million dollars each person per year. And so if you can eliminate the drivers, or at least reduce a large number of them, you have a significant opportunity for cost saving. And these four drivers are what's pushing the Australian industry towards this in the face of competition from uh, Brazil and India and Indonesia for the, for the products. So, so the, the prize isn't automation. The prize is better optimization of our business processes. Um, <coughs> A question, and I think this is a, an interesting question, given there's all this activity, and this activity has now been sustained and continues to grow in, in its, its size for over, the, for, for over a decade now, is, you know, is this just some lucky chance event that's occurred, or is there something more systemic occurring here? Is, is the industry changing? And the, the sort of marketing catchphrase that's often used for, for this type of change, which is fundamental, uh, where technology is involved, is the idea of moving into that second half of the chessboard. The, the analogy being with um, the, uh, the, the famous story of the inventor of chess being offered a reward from the uh, emperor of India, and he, he rather humbly asked that uh, on the first square of the chessboard, he'd like one grain of rice on the second two, and so on and so forth. And by the time you get to halfway through the chessboard, you've got two to the 32 minus one, or about four million grains of rice, a not insignificant amount, but once you go beyond that, 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 to that second half of the chessboard, you find the numbers rise ever more rapidly so that um, there is around about two billion grains of rice more on the, on the second half than the first. And it's this sort of idea that that technology often gets a momentum roll up and carries it through and, and things keep going. And, and a really good example that we're all familiar with in this is, of course, Moore's Law, the, the doubling of the number of transistors per square inch on microprocessors. But I'm not going to concentrate on that one by analogy, but rather another. And the analogy I'm going to look at is, is something that, as a mechanical engineer, I find very interesting, and that's the steam engine. The steam engine was absolutely pivotal to the Industrial Revolution. And what developed his steam engine around 1775? And its significance was that it allowed for the efficient generation of power. But it was by no means the first steam engine. Um, you can go right back to the Greeks, but, but if, we, if we tail it back a little bit, the Savary engine of, of around 1700 used a bellows operation to lift water from um, deep coal mines uh, to dewater them and, and keep them, keep them occupiable. Um, Newcomen in 1712 uh, improved on this basic design with his engine and uh, by around about 1760 there were 50 of these Newcomen engines in operation around British coal mines, one for more or less every coal mine then in operation. And what spent the period around 1770 as a technician working in this space and, and observing these mines. So why do we choose what? What was his great contribution? Of course, that was the condenser. He observed that if he was to condense the steam before, um, uh, as, as part of the, the, um, the, the, the process of, of uh, turning it over, he was able to improve or roughly double the efficiency of the process. The significance of this was that it meant that steam engines no longer had to be, to be bound to coal mines where there was a good and ready supply of coal to fuel them. There was an economic case for taking them away from coal mines and wonderful things happened. What of course improved his engine and, and we find examples in, in lots of museums. I always enjoy whenever you go to uh, the, U, the Imperial College Museum or Science Museum in London you can see some really great examples of these engines still in place. But, but a whole bunch of things then follow. The, the, what we call the Industrial Revolution. We started to have factories emerge and from those uh, more, more advanced factories and then larger factories and, and with bigger factories we got more and more um, 
people moving towards the cities and to transport them there. We had trains and, and those trains started to, to achieve such technical efficiency that they were outrun, able to outpace the, the, the best mode of transport at that time. And, and when we'd eked all we could out of steam, into the, into the game step, the internal combustion engine and then the, the turbine engine and DC motors and AC motors and so on and so forth. And we've been on this fantastic technological roller coaster or, or, or rocket ship, I'll say, for the last 250 years around this stuff. But the key facilitator was Watt's invention of the, the condenser. It was the catalyst for the whole thing. It would, have been, it would have been arguably developed at some point, but the key point was that was the key technological advancement that was made. And I think this is a good analogy for us as we think about what's happening in mining automation, a good point of reference. And, and a, a useful thing is to ask, we're seeing a lot more activity around automation. It's really starting to, we think, be important to business processes, certainly become part of the activities. And ask what was the what was the change that, that maybe has made this, this, this take place? And to my mind, it was the advances that occurred in sensing and associated processing of the environment in the mid-2000s, around about 2007, 8, when um, there was a lot of activity in the, in the early stages of autonomous cars. And that closed off what has often been called um, Moravec's paradox, you know, the, the sort of observation almost in the, in the 1980s that roboticists going into the field, planning out their future activities were thinking at that time, you know, the hard problems are going to be the planning problems. That's where we're going to find difficulty. And um, the, the sensory motor problems, those problems associated with sensing the world and making decisions that, that sense, decide, act, model that's so fundamental control would just melt away. They wouldn't be issues at all. But what we found was actually the reverse. And it's only in the last decade that we've started to see that flip, that um, the, the sensing and computing power that is available to us has allowed us to, to actually reverse that problem so that we're no longer bound by this. Um, so I'm going to talk about a particular example to try to, to try to draw this out. And it's a project we worked with Joy Global or P&H on for 10 years. And its purpose was to develop an autonomous mining excavator, um, or more particularly a mining shovel. And, and I hope that the, the background here is visible to you. But these are very large machines. To, to give some context, they're able to take 120 tonne scoops of earth and load them haul trucks that, that themselves are able to carry 360 tonnes. Um, they're almost dinosaur-like in their, their structures and forms, but they are the workhorse of hard rock mining, so copper and, and uh, nickel and, and other hard rock minerals uh, mined in a surface environment, um, but also very, very commonly used in coal mining. And they are key points of production. So if these machines get it wrong, the mine gets it wrong. And so going back to 2005, 6, 7, we worked, started working with Joy on a, on a bit of a vision to create a machine that was autonomous. And, and we've been now through that journey with them. It was the best part of a 10-year journey, many times exhausting and frustrating. But the, the basic scope of this machine was that it would be able to excavate and, and load without um, any human intervention, uh, that it would manage the the world around the machine, it's important that that environment maintain a good structure, and so it maintains the dig face and the floor. It is able to manage itself. These are electrically powered machines. They have a big cable out the back, so they have to have to manage that cable, and it was important that that, that be automated, that that's able to plan and execute high-level missions and feed the information. <coughs> Sorry, the information it gathers as it goes about its tasks back to mine plans so that they're updated in real time and has to, a capacity to monitor its health. And so we set out with this really quite grand vision uh, starting around 2005 and um, it, 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 it has been now through its what we call the research phase and several elements of it have come through to a commercial phase. 
Um, and so the work really started, I'm just a, a sort of potted history of it, but the Australian Coal Association commissioned my group back in 2004 to develop a, a bit of a roadmap for where we saw surface mining automation would go over the next, the next 20 years. And one of the things we identified in that was these mining shovels. Um, the state of the art was fairly, fairly low at the point we entered it. They didn't have the capacity to even monitor the amount of material they were collecting at each scoop, a function that is of critical importance when considered within the overall operation. Um, and so early work that we did was on using some estimation theory, uh, some multiple model adaptive filters to develop payload estimation systems that's able to estimate the payload and the centre of mass of that payload in the dipper so that um, how much material is excavated is known, but perhaps more importantly, so that we have a basis for um, not overloading trucks, a critical function, and for bringing in controls that allow us to narrow out the, the variance on those. And, and that work was done in early 2004, 2005 in Arizona. I spent my summers of 2004, 2005 um, in, in the hot Arizona, well, it was the, 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 the winter then, but, but it still seemed very hot. And um, ultimately, around about 2005, a product was launched by P&H that they imaginatively titled Payload. Around this same time, though, they, they were very kind and they installed a, a large, one of these large mining excavators. Their value's about 40 million. Ours was second hand and its value was probably in, in half of that. Um, nearby Brisbane in a, in a quarry for research purposes for this. And we set on a journey that we laid out that was intended to deliver a set of stepping stones along the way, all founded in proper research questions. And the first of those beyond payload was the idea of having a system that would stop the machine colliding with itself. And this was important because there's significant energy in those collisions and every time the bucket slams into the tracks, damage is done that requires ultimately those, those tracks to be replaced with the consequence of, of downtime and, and, uh, and, and other costs. Um, and that was commercialised in 2010. And off the back of this, ACARP, the people who had originally sponsored our, our vision, said, look, we'd like to support you to take this as far as you can take it. Um, and so we, we launched into a, a fairly ambitious project that had further stepping stones and we called them um, truck shield and auto swing. So truck shield was a system that did for trucks what truck shield did for, for, um, for, for the machine. It stopped, it stopped the, the shovel colliding with, with the trucks it was loading. Uh, and this is a really important question. There'd been two deaths uh, in, in the previous 12 months where people, truck drivers, had been um, compromised by, by the fact that the, the machines had, had uh, the, the, the shovels loading them had crashed into them. Um, and we went through various phases and uh, ultimately went through. And I'm going to show a video now that will give us a bit of an idea of this. And we're not getting any sound. I'll just pause that. It doesn't work anymore. All right. The ongoing imperative to increase productivity within the mining sector is driving a relentless march towards the automation of earth moving machines. Electric mining shovels are the workhorses of open cut mining and they've become the focus of automation under the Australian Coal Association Research Program's Shovel Load Assist Project, also known as SLAP. This project was brought forward and at the time there was a lot of uh, work going in terms of automation of truck units, but there wasn't any projects happening around the automation of the loading units. So this sort of fit the, the piece of the puzzle that we were looking for. This work is being undertaken by researchers at the University of Queensland in association with Joy Global Surface Mining and through the Cooperative Research Centre for Mining. The vision for the semi-automated mining shovel is to improve upon the decisions and actions performed by a human operator. The reasons for doing this are, first, 
an automation system can improve upon the decisions needed to control the machine to achieve better compliance to the production plan, reducing costs. Second, an automation system can perform the actions needed to operate the machine with greater precision and speed than a human operator, making the loading process faster, more repeatable and safer. The vision is that the automated mining shovel will survey its surrounding terrain to constantly update the mine plan, identify the position and orientation of trucks that arrive to be loaded, autonomously excavate to the mine plan, using the fewest number of passes when loading trucks and placing the load so it is equally distributed plan and execute positioning moves to optimally extract material and track other equipment operating around the shovel, such as bulldozers. The steps towards this vision have been realised by several elemental technologies. P&H payload measures the mass of material excavated by the shovel. P&H track shield stops the shovel colliding with itself. Truck shield prevents collisions with trucks being loaded. Dozer shield prevents the shovel colliding with cleanup equipment, such as bulldozers. Auto swing manoeuvres the bucket over the truck tray, releases the load and returns to the face with the operator having overall supervisory control. And autofill automatically loads trucks without the need for any operator intervention. There are some elements that we're content to sit at semi-automation level. Um, there are other elements that we are pushing towards the full autonomous um, scenario. Um, in terms of the shovel, ultimately we would like a fully autonomous shovel, so the, the current path that we're at it with, um, with the SLAP project has got us you know, part, part of the way down the, the pathway that we're looking for. The system uses a digital terrain map that it builds of its surrounds using LiDAR sensors. This terrain map is then analysed for locations where material can be excavated. When a truck arrives, the automation system tracks its position and orientation within the map. A sequence of loading cycles is planned that will fill the truck to its capacity in the shortest possible time. Each loading cycle comprises a motion that places the bucket at an identified digging position, a material excavation sequence that describes the motion of the bucket through the dig face, the identification of a dump point to place the load within the truck, the generation of a trajectory for transiting the bucket from the dig face to the dump point, and the release of the load into the tray. Planning loading cycles is complicated by several factors. When the excavator makes a dig, the material it removes will not exactly match what was planned. After the bucket has left the face, some material will usually collapse, changing the digging face. And when material is dumped to the truck tray, it may not be released exactly where planned and may not flow exactly as predicted. The automation system deals with these changes by continually monitoring the state of its surrounds and replanning its future loading cycles to compensate so that the truck is filled to capacity in a minimum possible time. With the ability to automatically load trucks, the next challenge is in determining how the mining shovel should choose where to move. The research team has started to make progress on this combinatorial decision problem. Here an industrial robot is mimicking a mining shovel at a small scale in a laboratory, planning how it will autonomously excavate a block of material. Eventually, the algorithms used to construct this mission plan will be deployed on full-scale excavators in production mines. When this is achieved, mining shovels will have effectively been automated. The significant benefits include better safety, reduced operational variability, improved compliance to the mine plan, and faster, more efficient truck loading. It's, it's, it comes back to those two key issues. One is the, the safety of our employees. So by automating or semi-automating, we're reducing the number of people that are exposed to high risk. And uh, the second element is the the impact on our business performance, the, which is ultimately reducing our unit cost of production so that our customers get their products cheaper than what they can today. The journey towards autonomous mining machines continues at pace. The development of autonomous mining shovels has the potential to transform the mining industry and is seen by many as the next big step in mining equipment automation. This work conducted by the Smart Machines Group at the University of Queensland has been made possible by the vision and financial support of the Australian Coal Association Research Program, Joy Global Service Mining and CRC Mining. So there was a, there was a significant program of development over, over the best part of 10 years to date. And I'll make the point that it, it draws on many different elements. And, and it's these four down the right-hand side, sensing, control, perception and situational awareness, which have really been the key. They're the, the ability to provide sensory motor capabilities to the machines through, through these functions. Um, I think it's fair to say we, we sort of 
have a fairly good grasp on this and, and the technology is, is moving forward to, um, to commercialisation through the next stages. There's already a number of products that have come out of the market um, that, that, that are based out of this um, and more to follow. And, and as, a, as an academic engineer, I, I'm really quite proud of that. You know, if you're going to do something, make it important, make it have consequence to somebody at least of, of importance. Now, under the bonnet of this system, there's, um, there's, there's the first sort of vestiges of, of what I called before. And in addressing this sensory motor issue, you know, that being able to sense, uh, decide, and then, then actuate to achieve outcomes, one of the, the, the problems that we've had to, to deal with is the collision avoidance problem. And I've hinted at it a little bit, you know, the, the collision of, of the machine with itself or with, with the trucks that it's loading or with other equipment in the, the area, such as the bulldozers that, that keep the, the bench on which it works nice and level. And this, um, it, it's, it's worth having a little look at, at the challenge here and, and the problem. Um, and, and to contextualise this, I'll, I'll just say that decisions made by the operator at any point actually play out and have their consequences several seconds into the future. A machine running at full speed, a large machine, takes around about 13 seconds to, to go from that full speed down to, to a stop. And so anything that the operator does will have consequences immediately. And this um, you know, sort of stimulates the mind towards, towards um, predictive control type, type approaches. I'll, I'll give you a sort of very brief view of, of, of the architecture. So the, the, um, the command for the machine, if, if we step back from full automation, there's a semi-automation piece, which is, which is just sort of a, a, a layer of control that sits underneath uh, the operator and, and guards against things like collisions. And um, the oper operator provides his command. Um, the obstacle avoidance uh, controller doesn't know future values of this command input. Um, and while the machines move slowly, there's a very significant amount of energy involved in their motion. So to give that a little bit of context, if they take a 120 tonne scoop, the bucket itself weighs another 80 to 90 tonnes. The uh, referred inertia of the, the machine house out at the point of the bucket might be another 500 tonnes and the whole thing is moving at two to three metres per second um, out, out at the points where collisions occur. And so you have a very, very significant amount of energy, several megajoules, which uh, should a collision occur, it's important. And the control problem is is characterised by the fact that we are very limited in the rate in which we can redraw that kinetic energy back through the actuators. And so um, the, the, uh, the obstacle avoidance filter, as we've called it, needs to be able to look into the future and make decisions about what's, what's happening or what's likely to happen to avoid those collisions. Um, so the problem can be defined as, as follows. Modification of a reference signal from the operator to ensure that in the future, Collisions with obstacles are avoided, taking into account the performance limits of the machine, and it looks very much like a constrained predictive control problem, and of course it is. Um, in a sort of diagrammatic form, very loosely, the shovel is under uh, speed control, velocity control from the operator. So he has some joysticks, and as he deflects those joysticks, it provides a speed reference to the various degrees of freedom, and there are three of them that are important here. Um, and so the avoidance filter model that we've used looks to sit in between the, um, the operator's joystick references, take those joystick references and employ some state feedback to um, make corrections or predict corrections that avoid the collision. And it's a, it's a fairly simple architecture. Um, we bring in information about the environment, you know, the shape and form of the truck and, and the shape of, um, of, of the the, um, of, of uh, whatever's being sensed out in the world and that all gets churned into in the avoidance filter to generate a set of reference deltas called VK here which look to uh, adjust from what the operator is commanding so that collision is averted. And in a, in a, again, in a fairly conceptual way, our, um, our, our system uh, given operator commands might take some general form uh, where, where a collision might occur, 
and this is just to sort of give you the idea, it's looking to make those corrections at various times into the future so that it avoids that collision. And um, this, this is a key underlying element of the, the technology. Um, well, mathematically, it, it could be written as follows. You know, we're, we're going to minimise some, some cost. The cost we look to minimise is the amount of those, those variations, the, the norm value of those variations discounted over, over time. We have some system dynamics, which are quite accessible. They can be determined fairly, fairly straightforwardly using, um, using, using just classical methods for, for modelling. Uh, our inputs belong to some set of allowed, allowed inputs and states. Uh, we've got a set of obstacles that we don't want to violate uh, and we've got some terminal constraints. And it's a, it's a very nice um, receding horizon control formulation uh, with some complications, of course, uh, the complications being the nonlinearity of the system dynamics and the complexity of the geometry. But in principle, it should work. And our early efforts at solving this problem look to apply what I'll call textbook methods, methods that, that can be uh, drawn or, or their, their, their heritage can be drawn fairly um, clearly from existing literature. And in our initial work in this space, um, where we were looking at, at two-dimensional problems, we, we, uh, we came up with some nice ideas about how we could represent objects by um, axial line bounding trees that allowed us to transform the geometry constraints into, into mixed integer um, uh, programming problems. We, we had a linear system under velocity control. Uh, in this particular instance, we've got random operator inputs uh, just to help you make sense of what's happening here. The blue dots are a trajectory that's passed by the, 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 the point uh, that represents our system. Uh, the green are uh, the points in the, the prediction horizon that are in free space and therefore can be traversed and those red parts are, are large and as you see various um, boxes coming in and out that corresponds to different levels of this um, bounding box sort of tree that, that describes uh, the, the, the object underlying here, its, it's convexity um, appearing as constraints in our optimization problem with the idea being that you only try to solve the, the, um, the, the smallest optimization problem that you can. And we thought this was really good. We thought we had a great conceptual framework for addressing this problem. The only problem is it didn't actually work when we took it out and tried it on the machine. And um, indeed, we tried a whole bunch of similar methods. We tried methods uh, based around pre-computed invariant sets that would allow us to, to, uh, to uh, determine collision-free commands. Uh, we tried sequential convex programming ideas. You know, the, the general mantra is make it convex and then solve the convex optimization problem and you will get an optimal control of some form. But those non-linearities and the geometry defeated us. They made it, the sort of system sort of worked, but they didn't work well enough, certainly to go forward with, with uh, any mine site testing and indeed suffered from, from a number of issues. We couldn't find solutions in some instances to the problem. Um, we had fairly poor operator acceptance. Our, our um, computational rates were, were too slow and, and a number of other areas. And that, that's, that's a really interesting thing because um, what we did find were less pure methods, P methods that, you know, at least to me, in my mental state at that time, appeared like compromised solutions. Solutions where um, we couldn't get it working the right way, so we were going to try other ways. And, and, and the other ways we tried were, were naive in a sense. We, we just simply said, well, we've got some nonlinear dynamics and we've got some constraints, and this is largely a nonlinear problem with this complex geometry constraint set on it why don't we just tackle the problem from that perspective and look to, to deal with that? And over a period of time, uh, including bringing in uh, GPUs to do a lot of the, the simulations in parallel, who are running multiple hypothesis sets, we found that the ideas really started to work quite well. It's, it's, it's an interesting sort of, it's an interesting mindset that it was really methods from computer science rather than control theory that were helping us address this problem even though they, they still had a nicely well-founded set of ideas. And I've often wondered 
whether the theory that we have in this area is so constrained to toy problems, so embedded in those toy problems that we're not able to step up to the really big, hard, challenging problems and deal with those, with those methods. And were we to start with the more difficult challenges and, and not lose ourselves constantly in, in interesting but simpler issues, we might make, well make some good progress. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make the point that, that in all of this, and I, I hope you can sort of get the, the idea, but the next slide may, may, may make it a little bit richer. Um, often the optimizations we were doing were very trivial. We were just using bisection algorithms to, to iterate things and, and working with bounds. So it wasn't, it wasn't heavily optimization based, uh, although its intent was, it was strongly computational based. And these methods have worked. And, and to give you a sense of, of the heuristics we use to guide our solution choices, our trajectory choices, um, th this is just, just an idea. We, we posed the sorts of solutions that the system would look to explore in terms of rules that made common sense in the application. Rules that an operator who might have this system underneath him with uncertainty about how it would behave, um, gain confidence through the fact that the behaviours it would exhibit were well known. So it would still farm out many hypotheses in each rule, uh, but, but the rules would really constrain the, the way in which those hypotheses worked. Um, and just to, to sort of give you a, a sort of sense of this, um, I've tried to notionally depict the idea again here, where I've got my input and time, obviously scaled down to 2D. Um, I've got my machine and I've got an obstacle and I've got some future trajectory with a, with, a, with a violation or a collision predicted at some future time. And we would explore sets of different um, solutions using this receding horizon control, you know, the, the idea that you simulate forward, you compute a, an input sequence that avoids the collision and then uh, apply the first element of that sequence, then do the whole thing over again, being the, the fundamental idea of it but doing the, what we'll call the optimization step using multiple hypotheses running in parallel on computers. And some, some interesting things emerged in that, uh, and they included some new sets of constraints. So we found that operators themselves, with this system between them and the, the machine, controls or the motors, started to, to ask for things like, say, well, you know, we don't want it to act soon, we want it to act as late as possible and they, they lead to further rules. And, and it was an interesting story. This, this little graphic will give an idea. This is um, a sort of MATLAB rendering of, of a shovel looking from a bird's eye view with a, with a bulldozer uh, being tracked. Um, on the right hand side is the data that comes from it. The red gives the, the swing speed of the machine and the blue gives um, the reference provided by the operator and the green shows the system kicking in as late as possible, in this case, as the dozer violates that circle, it brings the machine to a stop as rapidly as it can by plugging the drives and then uh, when the dozer moves out, it allows it to, to remove. And so that, that will give you a, a sort of sense of the idea. Uh, the same, the same for, for the truck. Um, again, a set of scenarios which represent what is likely to correspond to operator behaviours organised hierarchically, so we search through them, we run hypotheses on each and reject, reject them when we find that, that certain uh, scenarios aren't able to, uh, to avoid the collision. Um, just some, okay. some uh, footage from some site trials conducted in uh, 2005, which will give a sense of this.
All right, everyone's great concern, of course, was this technology would slow things down. This was particularly the concern of the mining companies. So we ran this system, um, well, it's run now for over a year at uh, Lake Lindsay Mine in the Bowen Basin. It's a coal mine in, on the east coast of, of Australia, central Queensland, and um, this was some of the early results which, which gave us great confidence that it wasn't actually going to carry with it a significant impact for, for productivity. And so it's, it's, it's a set of cycles collected over, over probably the period of a couple of days or a day and a half, um, ordered from fastest to slowest. So, so a swing cycle is the time it takes the machine to remove itself from the face and swing across to the truck. And the time it takes, of course, depends largely on on um, two things, where the truck is and how hard the operator drives. And uh, one of the things that really pleased us uh, with this data, but it's played out in much larger data sets subsequently, is that it, it was not having any considerable impact on the time taken for completion of those cycles. Um, the, the truck shield cycles were of the same order or scattered within the, the other uh, systems without those. And likewise for the auto swing component, again, the business case here from the mining company's point of view is around reducing the time it takes to load trucks and to, to bring new ones in. And we were able to, to show a significant increase in, in, um, in, in uh, the, 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 the speed that was achieved by the system, um, the maximum speed that was achieved and that translated to around about a 10% reduction in, in um, loading times and uh, a useful and significant uh, contribution there. Um, so where are we at with that? Well, um, the research phase for those components of work has now, now finished. Uh, Joy or P and H uh, on target to release the, the, the system that avoids truck collisions and dozer collisions in 2017 uh, and uh, they're looking at 2018 for their, for their auto swing component. The, the idea there, if you recall, is that the operator presses a button and after, after doing the dig manually and the system locates the truck, places the load and, and swings back into position. And then uh, a 2021 release for uh, their, their auto fuel product. Um, and so this is you know, indicative of the sort of timelines involved, but the complexity of these systems uh, is, is quite considerable. So that, that gives a little bit of a feel for, for the problem and, and how we solved it. And the take home messages uh, are, are fairly straightforward, okay? Um, this sort of concept of receding horizon control, we think, has been critical along with advances in the sensing technology that we, we were able to leverage in the work uh, in, in addressing that challenge of delivering sensory and motory control of the machine, you know, that sense decide and act uh, um, uh, trilogy. Um, and in a sense, we think, you know, in doing that, at least for this example, we've conquered that, that Maravex paradox, that idea that, you know, the, the problem is not a panning problem, it's, it's a sensory motor problem. Um, and, but I've, and I've made this point a couple of times, this wasn't achieved by the application of those, those textbook methods. We had to sort of go beyond those and try to come up with ways to address it. And it, it, it makes me wonder why we don't spend more time in our research literature trying to improve on, on general methods. You know, you can conceive of, of very general methods that, that, that would be able to address these problems as the basis for, um, for the, the sort of applications area rather than continuing to focus on, on uh, some of the, um, the algorithms that we, we like because they're elegant and conceptually complete and, and all the rest. Um, but when we bring them out into the field, they tend to fail us. Okay, so where to next? And I, I think this is interesting. This, this to me has been something of an epiphany and that is we now find ourselves with a, a series of problems that are related to um, a sort of reversal of, of uh, Moravec's uh, paradox. We, we're, we're finding that the, the challenge for us is no longer with the, um, with the sensory motor challenge, which, which delayed us for so many years, but has switched back to the path planning challenge when, and the benefit here for the industry is around that improved optimization. And 
again, we've found that receding horizon uh, type solutions are giving us an answer in this. And so I'll just talk briefly to a couple of points here. This machine that I'm showing you is a drag line. It's a very large machine. It's the largest, it's the cheapest way to move dirt in, in open cut mining. To give you a sense of scale, the distance from the boom tip to the base here is around about 96 metres. And they can take um, uh, buckets of 100 tonnes and they can move them on that 96 metre radius. And they're used in a process called strip mining, which I've tried to illustrate here. This drag line is uncovering coal, so it's removing material that covers coal, and it's placing the material it removes into the void that was left the last time it, um, in the strip next door, the, the, the last time coal, or the last place the coal was removed. And it, it works its way up the strip. And, and a very interesting problem for these machines is what we call the excavation sequencing problem. The idea that we need to determine where to place the machine, what material to take from that position and where to spoil it. And if we get that wrong, we end up with not being able to put all the dirt we need to into the available space or having to move the dirt further than we might optimally need to. In, and, and the further we need to move it, of course, the larger the cost. And we've been looking at how to solve this problem to try to find optimal excavation sequences um, again, this is a very heavily computational problem and I can just show a quick video. This is the sort of sequence that we might find and our intention at this point is not to automate these machines but rather to provide guidance to operators given the terrain around them that they determine from scan um, what, what, what's going on. So I'll just briefly give you a sense of, of the operation and what's involved. Um, And I'm sorry it's not playing out of the PowerPoint, but it's... Bear with me as I demonstrate my incompetence at using computers Uh, for some reason, it doesn't want to play for me. All right, in, in any event, this again is, is, a, is very much in that same vein where we need to look ahead, um, or we've found there's great advantage in being able to look ahead at the actions of the machine and, and uh, plan its, its motions. Um, as, a, as a final example, I want to talk about something that I mentioned right at the beginning, and that is um, our automated dozers, a system that we've developed in collaboration with Caterpillar. Um, Caterpillar make a number of products for the mining space, most notably trucks, but their premier line is dozers and they're, they're well known for these. And, and sometimes these dozers are used in a coal production process known as pivot push dozing. The idea is the machines uh, remove the material um, that, that is above coal in the same way as the drag line did, but, but rather, not by, by excavating it, but rather by pushing it from, from above the coal into the void. And this figure will give you some sense of what this involves. We have here the terrain of, of, uh, of uh, the, the material to be moved um, post, post blasting it, and it tends to, to form a, a sort of shape characteristic of this, and the dozer needs to systematically work its way down, pushing material as it goes from, from um, over on the, the left-hand side over <coughs> to the right-hand side. And there is an enormous potential for the number of ways it might, it might look to achieve this. And again, one of our, our efforts in this, this work has been to try to come up with ways to, to sequence the movement of, of the dozer so that it is able to uncover that coal in the most efficient way. And I'll just bring up a video, hopefully here, that will capture the idea. And I'll just have this as a... a 
bit of a, a teaser for you. Um, but in this particular instance, we're trying to find an optimal sequence of pushes for the dozer so the dozer will work slots of material um, so that it is able to uncover that coal optimally. And it's interesting to look at, again, we're, we're doing this via a receding horizon approach where we look at 10 slots ahead. Our underlying framework is, in this instance, a dynamic programming problem where we do uh, some, some coarse uh, work with, with, uh, with sort of volumes moved, and then we look to find uh, the sequence of movements or slots to be progressed by the dozer um, with the constraints, the key constraints, that it wants to advance that front at more or less a uniform rate to do so brings with it a productivity benefit and it can't allow any particular part of the pit to drop um, below other parts uh, because that makes it unworkable. And so again, we've found that receding horizon control ideas are showing us some nice, nice ways forward in answering this. So, so the moral of the, the story, I suppose, overall um, is uh, that, that while we're not using the ideas in the elegant form. I think we, we originally started out with in our mind when we were um, conceiving of these projects. We have found the basic principles to be really, really powerful at a number of levels. Um, the way in which we do the key computations for control though hasn't fitted into this, what I call the, the convexify and then optimize type solution, but rather something that's much rawer, much more brute force but is still proven to be quite effective. And I put to you that there, are, there must be opportunities to really advance this particular um, set of, 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 uh, of uh, problems that are solved or are amenable to this, and it represents a, a really good research challenge that would bring with it a substantive value, I think, as we move forward in the industry. So that's, that's my, um, my message today, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor McCary, for that very interesting uh, presentation and some thought-provoking ideas that you leave the audience with.